stand at your sacred desk that I, after 25 years of ministry, still tremble when I stand. We come, we come to be encouraged and to hear a word from you. We come, oh God. We come. We come as you called us to come. My sermon title for today is An Easter Shut-In. An Easter Shut-In. The disciples' friends had just celebrated the High Holy Day, Easter. And who would think that their life's reality would crash in on them so quickly? They were reflecting about the drastic shift from the highs of Easter morning to the lows of Easter night. The disciples had watched the, the church praise dancers on the road to Jerusalem, waving palms with joy and adoration and throwing their cloaks on the road, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But then within a few days, they watched those same religious folks, 
the praise dancers had shifted and the praise dancers were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And after that, church, they witnessed Jesus, their rabboni, their intimate term for their teacher. They witnessed him being arrested and being crucified and buried. But oh my, on a dark morning, in the dark of the morning, Mary Magdalene was at the empty tomb from which Jesus Christ had risen, as he said he would. And Mary preached. Mary preached the first Easter worship celebration message that Jesus is alive. Last week I lifted her up as we ended Women's History Month as a woman who was focused and filled and grateful and on point, the first woman to preach an Easter message. And it was ironic that I was preaching that last week when a gentleman came to the door and wanted to come in for Easter service and wanted to know who was the pastor. And when I was pointed out up here as the pastor, he said, no, I won't come in. This is against my beliefs. And he left. How poignant, I didn't know what was happening but we still have those who don't believe in women in ministry. And I've often said to people who have said that to me, well, that's nice that you don't believe, but I know I'm called and I'm here. Amen. Because see, some call themselves, and some of us think that we can call others, but the calling comes from God. And God had called Mary Magdalene. It was no accident that she was there to be the first witness and to preach that first Easter message. Friends, churches for generations have had shut-ins. They've had lock-ins, times of waiting and times of watching in times of singing and praying for spiritual enhancement, coming together, waiting for a visitation from the Divine One. Churches had embraced what they learned from the biblical accounts of Jesus. Jesus appearing to the disciples and breathing upon them in an upper room at church in an upper room after, and in an upper room after his ascension and the acts of the apostles, when he sent the Holy Spirit to a wider group of disciples, now in an upper room again at church to breathe on them as well. Something happens when we come together in this place it's not that we can't connect with God at home and connect with God through nature, in the park or on the backside of the mountain. God is everywhere. And I lift up the different ways in which people connect with God. But there is nothing more powerful, and scripture says don't forsake the assembly. However often you come, don't forsake the assembly because it is in this assembly. It is in we who come together and the doors then get closed. It doesn't mean people can't come in, but something happens in the church. Something happens when we greet each other and we sit next to each other and we are focused on God, all of us at one time, in one place, in one space. There is something that happens people of God. There is a visitation. It may not be visible, but there is a visitation. There is the breath of God. There is the presence of God. So why do we do this thing? We, we do this and they were shut in so that they could receive power. 
they were in that room and we are in this room to believe. Though some of us may cry out, God help my unbelief, but we come because we seek to believe. We come to receive instruction. Some of this we can't learn on our own. We come to receive instruction. We come to be prepared to share the gospel. Sharing the gospel is not only my responsibility. My job is to equip the saints for ministry. It is your job to share the good news of Christ. We come to access and utilize the ordained gifts that God has given us. Each of us has spiritual gifts. Some we don't even know, but those gifts are often displayed when we are connected to a church and in the presence of God. There are gifts that you may not even know that you have. There are evident gifts like singing or, or speaking, but what other gift? Someone may have a gift of healing in their hands. Someone may have the gift of administration or the gift of faith where we all have faith, but those who have a gift of faith, it is deep and they can set others ablaze with their gift. Am I talking to you this morning, church? The gifts, the gifts to build God's church, not our church, God's church, God's church that the gates of hell will not prevail. I posted recently on Facebook that there is a decrease in church attendance, as you can see, there is a decrease in churches. Churches are closing. Right? There's, a, there's a decrease in that, and everybody's talking about what's happening with the church, but I'm here to tell you, God's church is not declining. God's church never closes. God's church will prevail. As he said, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Man's church is closing. Man's church cannot withstand the weight of what God is calling it to do. Man's church is the church that we've taken over and done things the way that we want to do them. That's closing. We're in a time where God is raising up God's people for such a time as this. And God never needed a whole lot of people. God turned an upside down world right side up with a few. I think of, I think it was Gideon who had a large army of maybe 10,000 and God allowed that army to dwindle to 300 till he used him. 300 who lapped water like dogs. 300 who weren't gonna wait for a glass or a spoon. 300 who would go after it. 300 who were diligent and present. That's what God will do and that's what God is waiting for. And so church, we too are coming off the exhilaration of celebrating Easter. After 40 days of spiritual practices, many of us did devotional reading every month. I hope you like that. We had that every morning at 6 a.m. Some of us are coming off of 40 days of praying and fasting and worshiping, but then we too had an Easter night. And now it's the second Sunday of Easter. How quickly time flies. And what happens now? What happens now? Because that which had been prophesied and became reality now rests upon us, the followers of Christ. And so as it was with those disciples in John's gospel, so it is for us, we too are gathered, wondering, waiting, watching, and worshiping. We too are asking the important question, the elephant in the room question, that we probably will not say publicly, but what happens now? 
Where is he? Where is this Jesus now that's risen? Where, where is he? We were excited last week and we celebrated last week, but the ham is gone. And I didn't even get to get any, darling. The ham is gone. The turkey is gone and the, the fancy Easter dishes have been put away. If you grew up in a household like mine and my mother is listening, we only got to use those dishes four times a year. But the, the nice Easter dishes have been put away. And yet we don't sense that anything changed or anything is different. He promised deliverance. He promised resurrection. He promised new life, but where, where is he? The early disciples wrestled with fear and abandonment, and so do we. We wrestle with political discord, health instability, and social insecurity. Where is he? After such great promises, he has, it appears as though he has left us in a lurch. We have hung our very existence upon those promises that he is coming back again, but where is he? The bills are due. The loan didn't come through. The new job didn't pan out. Did he get lost? Is Jesus back at the temple disputing with the naysayers? As grandma would say, Mr. Jesus, Sir Jesus, it costs about $4 now for a loaf of bread. Gas is about three fifty dollars or more a gallon in Connecticut. Where is he? Starvation and violence rules and reigns in Palestine, his home place. Where is he? A bridge collapsed in Baltimore by human error, but there are many others. Many other bridges are in disrepair. Where is he? Earthquakes, typically relegated to the West Coast, are coming to Connecticut. Some 250 years after New Jersey, I read, had its initial earthquake. Where? Is he? Folks in New Jersey are nervous. Folks in Ni Nigeria are afraid. Folks in Uganda are uncertain. Folks in Washington are worried. There's a building boom going on here in Norwalk. And we wonder what impact will that have on the environment, on traffic patterns, and our cost of living. Will it be too expensive for us to remain here? Many have moved out of the town already. Will we become or have we already become victims of gentrification? Where is he? Where is he? Where is he when our hearts feel empty and our minds are yet confused? Where is he when Christmas and the resurrection have both unfolded? Is this a trick? Is it a joke? Is this for real? Is God playing us for fools? Where is he? Aren't some of us wondering this morning, where is he? Some may say Pastor Tamar preached a somewhat powerful message on Easter Sunday. But I wonder if she ever doubts, where is he? I'll tell you where he is. Christ is behind our willingness to exercise the social, economic, and political will we have to act and to make change. The question isn't only where is he, the question should be where are we? Where are we? Yes, we are here in this room where he told us to go and wait, and now he isn't here. And so we cry out, how long, God? How long? 
Not long, said the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King about dark and difficult moments waiting for change to come. The disciples waited to see him again to make sure that it was really real. But they were afraid, and wouldn't you be? Didn't you see what they did to our rabbi on that cross? Where is he? He shows up when we say enough is enough. He shows up when we decide to take care of teachers at the same level we take care of our athletes. Ah. Jesus says, I am giving you time to not only wait on me, but time to prepare and time to plan, time to develop your destiny, to determine who you will be for me. You see, we have destroyed much of our very existence. This is the month that we are celebrating Earth Day. And I was reminded that we have destroyed much of the ocean. We've discarded plastics and debris in our oceans. We've done a good job of destruction. Much of our air is bad. The land, the soil is contaminated. We also have issues with water. And we want to go to Mars. We want to go to Mars while cancer is ravaging families. There's nothing wrong with scientific exploration and going, but we cannot forget those that are here. We cannot forget the issues that are at hand for those of us who live in the earth. Who in here has not been impacted by mental illness, anxiety, and depression? Those three are impacting our families and the young amongst us at rates never before seen. So where is he? Where is he, Norwalk? Where is he, Connecticut? He's coming, and he is here. So what can we do? What are we empowered to do? Church, we can't stop pollution ourselves, but we can pick up a piece of trash. We can't stop alienation, but we can say a good hello and a good goodbye and give someone a hug. We can't stop loneliness, but we can be a friend to the friend. We can't stop diseases ourselves, but we can advocate for, fight for, march for, write for health care. We can't stop ignorance. Lord knows I wish we could. But church, we can tell the truth because we're taught that the truth can make us free. And we can give somebody some scripture. We can give one of these Bibles away. And I encourage you, if you know someone who wants one, give it to them. Because we don't have to redo a Bible and put our name on it and sell it. The Gideons give Bibles for free. So where is he? He's here in us. And he's saying it's time to come out of the upper room. It's time for the shut-in to end. It's time for us to come out, come out, be who we are, use what he's given us, know that Christ is in us and is empowering us. So we don't have to keep waiting. We don't have to keep wondering. We don't have to keep watching. Look in the mirror. There he is. There he is. In Jesus' name.